church has lost touch, in a sense, with Bible study, with really getting in the Word, with really... Uh, by the way, the little children can be released at this time. I'm sorry. Y'all can go to y'all's class. Unless you want to stay in here, the pastor. No. I'm sure you want to go. In the Gospel of John, it talks about Jesus becoming the Word. The Word became flesh and walked among us. And then I'll get into that in a little bit. But I want to encourage you about the Word of the living God. It comes to me in Proverbs 2 and Proverbs 3. It talks about if we would keep that Word inside of us before our eyes. If we would go after the wisdom of God through the Word of God like men hunt gold and silver. If we would seek His wisdom like that, we would be most highly blessed. If we would have a passion to go after the knowledge of God through the Word of God, wisdom would begin to flow like never before, and we would get the wisdom to come back and get our nation back on course. But the first thing that needs to be set back on course and back in order is the church. Because when you have 84% of the people at one time call themselves Christians, and we let one atheist dictate to take prayer out of school, we got a problem. And guys, the problem starts right here. So I take my responsibility. I will stand before God. I will be judged by what I encourage you to do with the word I encourage you with, and I'll be judged greater than you will be judged. But let me tell you something about that. I'm going to do what I feel God tells me to do, not what you think I ought to do. <laughs> so, with that said, you need to do the same thing. You need to be led by the Holy Spirit in line with the Word of the living God that you don't let any person or any individual or any voice come into your mind get you off track. You always need to come back on track with the Word of the living God so it will stabilize you and keep you going forward in Jesus' name. Amen? So as we begin to think about this morning, the Word and, and the Bible and what it was given to us, I mean, it's the most printed book in the world. I mean, it's the number one bestseller in the world. But Americans, I've been looking at polls, have not given enough time to studying and reading the Word. You can't get enough at, with an hour uh, in church on Sunday, you've got to spend time every day in the Word of God. And if you would, I'm telling you, if you would, wisdom would begin to come. I mean, you can study this book about Jesus. I, I was just talking in the men's meeting yesterday about how Jesus taught. This is how he taught. I mean, he didn't give you an hour-long Bible study. What he gave you is a life lesson walking through the streets. A crowded street, and all of a sudden, all this commotion takes over, and all kinds of commotion. And this Gentile that's not even under the covenant, this little woman that's supposed to be shut up in a house somewhere, it's against the law for her to be on the streets because of her condition. All of a sudden, because of her passion, her knowledge, and her wisdom, she knew if she could get to Jesus, she'd be healed. What did she do? She didn't sit and gripe about the crowd. She didn't get along and start crying. Oh, man, you know, God, if you could just help me get to him. No, she got up in her condition. For 12 years, she'd had it. She pressed out into the crowd. She probably crawled on her hands and knees. She pushed in. She knew where she was going. She knew what she needed. And she didn't let any opposition stand in her way. But she went to the living Word of the living God and grabbed Him. And virtue left Him. She become well. And the life lesson was, Who touched me? That means we can have 20,000 sitting here and one may be touching the anointing of the living God and he knows it. And the disciple said, what do you mean who touched me? He said, somebody withdrew virtue from me. And the woman was there and she was afraid. She was out in public. She was afraid. She said, Lord, it was me. And, and the life lesson was this. You don't have to go very far if you want to learn. First of all, the lesson was, 
Know who you're going after. Have the passion to get there. And don't let opposition stop you. And then you will hear God say, Well done, thy good and faithful servant. You know what, she said, what he said to her? Life lesson. Your faith hath made thee whole. It didn't take a lifetime to learn. It took a time with God, with His presence, His anointing affecting your life and your body, and all of a sudden Jesus said, Your faith hath made you whole, Brother Steve. Get up and go with it. You don't need a seminary degree. Get up and go with it. You know what we need is an encounter with Almighty God through the Word and the Holy Spirit combined together, and then we got the best lesson we could ever have. Amen? So, so what I'm saying is this. When you come to church, come expectant to get a life lesson from Jesus, and it may be one word or two words that sets you free. It might take you to a new level. It may, I mean, she didn't, he didn't turn around and say, Oh, woman, you ain't supposed to be out in the street. You ain't supposed to be out here. Why did you come out? You know it's against the law. And he didn't even say, Oh, woman, you know what healed you? It was me that healed you. No, he encouraged her by saying, Woman, your faith made you whole. Amen? And it's going to be your faith that makes the church whole. It's going to be your faith that brings back America once again. It's going to be your faith that gets families put back together. It's going to be your faith that sees that your children turn from the drugs that they're in and all the loss that they're in. It's going to be your faith that comes back to a place of security with God. It's going to be your faith that makes a difference in this season. So don't be looking to somebody else's faith. If she would have been dependent on the disciples, they would have knocked her down and told her she didn't have a covenant and sent her back home. Amen? So I want to talk to you a little about the Word of God. You know, the Word of God is given according to 2 Timothy 3, 16 and 17. All Scripture is given by inspiration of God. Do y'all believe that? Do y'all believe that all these books that was put together, there's several of them, right? They're different books that make up one book. They're inspired by God. We really don't need a watchtower. We really don't need the Book of Mormon. We really don't need any other books, although books are good if they're not taking claim that they're divine. We really don't need any other kind of books to add or take away from this book. What we need is enough faith to get in this book, study it, and expect God to give us revelation. And why do we get revelation? Not because we can feel puffed up or, or over the top, so we can change society through the inspiration God gives us and help those that don't know and rise to a new occasion and give God some voice in the earth that's really His voice. Amen? So we need to understand all Scripture is given by inspiration of God. Everybody say... It is God-given Scripture. God gave it. Okay. Okay, say this. All Scripture is given by inspiration of God. Well, Romans ten seventeen says faith comes by hearing the Word of God. Did you just hear it? That should build faith inside of you. Wait a minute. I can trust this book. If this is the ultimate Word of God, then I can go to it for any problem I'm in. I mean, it doesn't make any difference if it's a family problem, if it's a state problem, if it's a national problem, if it's a relationship problem, it's if it's a financial problem, you can find the inspiration and revelation right here to get you out of it. But see, you've got to first believe it was from God. He inspired it. He gave it, and, and He'll back it up all the way. Amen? So, it is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness. That the man of... Hey, listen. 
Everybody think, you know, in this society, you go up and correct somebody and tell them they need to be quiet and turn around and listen a minute. You don't ever see them again. Amen? Yeah. I mean, I, I'm a little bit more base because God said I'll use the base things of the world to confound the wise, so I'm pretty base. So you've got to understand, I speak base. I, I speak kind of... You, un you understand what I'm saying? I don't ever mean to offend anyone. I mean to rescue and to bring back and to set up right through the Scripture so that people have victory. Now listen to this. All Scripture is given by inspiration of God. Does everybody believe that? If you don't, come up here to prom and pray for you. No. <laughs> okay? And it's profitable for doctrine. It means it'll set your belief pattern right. For reproof. What is reproof? And for correction. It means it comes in, it will begin to show you where you're wrong, and maybe some of your traditions were wrong, and maybe some of your ideologies are wrong. It will begin to straighten that out as we begin to study. For instruction in righteousness. Why did God send it? Next verse, the next portion of the Scripture. That the man of God may be perfect, thoroughly furnished unto all good works. Okay, why does he want us to be see it first? The Word of God is inspired by God, given through men. And that it's good for doctrine. That means, but you've got to study the... I mean, when we had Shane Krauser come here and teach on the Constitution... And, you know, I don't know the Constitution from front to back. I hardly know, you know, I hardly know any of it by word. I know the spirit of the Constitution somewhat. But Americans don't know the Constitution. And really and truly, it'd be better if we did, wouldn't it? Christians don't know the Bible. They're just taking it from someone that cuts up on Sunday and begins to deliver a message, and you don't know whether it's true or not. I want you to check me out. I want to know that I go to the Word of God, and I'll give you 20 to 50 scriptures every service. Okay? Why does He want us to be corrected and reproved and instructed through the Word of God so that we might become a man with perfect thinking? Romans 12, 1 and 2 says that be ye transformed by the renewing of your mind that we'll not continue to do and operate the way we used to operate, but we will operate in line with this book as it's inspired by the Holy Spirit to make a difference in this season. Amen? Okay, Hebrews 4 and 12. The Word of God is quick. And it's powerful. You see, the Word of God is full of living power because Jesus became the Word and walked among us, right? It's full of living power, making it operative, active, energizing, and effective. Listen, guys, listen to me. If we can get a passion for the Word like we do for other things, I mean, I know some of you are driving all over the world, trying to make $100. I know we're looking to try to get income, and, and I'm not saying that's bad. I'm saying maybe first we ought to go to the Word, dig into the Word and get in our prayer closet and say, Lord, I feel like I'm spinning my wheels. I feel like maybe I need some help. So I'm asking for wisdom. How do I succeed right now? Give me something to put these hands to that gets me b above poverty level that gets me to where I can operate, get me where I can do the things of God, and then bring into being that, that Scripture where it says, whatsoever you put your hand to will prosper. Well, I need it to get into... Remember, we've been talking about the currency of heaven, and we talked about uh, there's different types. God's given currency is faith, and that God's given to every man, woman, or child that's born again the measure of faith. And, uh, and we have... Uh, the measure of faith as it starts, and he says, if you've got the faith,
faith of a grain of mustard seed. You can speak to this mountain, tell it to go into the sea, and it will. It will obey you. And, and we said, okay, it's time to get out of, if it's a currency of heaven which operates and pulls forth from the hope of God, the promise of God, according to Hebrews 11.1, 1, now faith is the substance of things hoped for and the evidence of things not seen yet, then we need to understand there is a way that we can retrieve our covenant promises from God through faith, through the hope of God. And as we begin to believe and understand that we can develop our faith and we can get from penny, dime, nickel, quarter faith, we can get all the way up and we need to move into million dollar faith. Why? It costs Jesus no more for you to operate in million dollar faith as it does for you to operate in nickel faith. Do you understand what I'm saying? I'm relating it to, to money so we can understand. But in the kingdom of God, there's no lack. There's no deficiency. Uh, you can't withdraw all the provision of God. It is, uh, it is massive. It's beyond our human finite minds to understand that God is called creator. And he's created so much that humanity could never withdraw even enough to put a dent in his reservoir. But he's based it on our sowing, our reaping, our faith. He said the man of God must walk by faith, not by sight. And I believe the church has been conditioned to walk by sight like Thomas. We talked about Thomas yesterday. Jesus had to come back to a man that refused to believe that his resurrection had taken place. And Thomas said, I won't ever believe it unless I put my fingers in his hands and the side. I'm not going to believe it. You know what? The mercy of God took over in Jesus. Jesus walked right through the wall and said, Okay, Thomas, all the rest of the guys believed just because of what they were told. You have to see. So I'm not going to cast you out. I'm not going to leave you laying down. If you're one that has to see, I believe God will manifest something to you that he'll manifest himself, that the provision of God will come alive. And Thomas said, Okay, Lord, I believe now. He said, It's great that you believe. But it was even greater for those that believed that didn't have to see with the natural eye. They took it by faith. The Word will build faith inside of you that all the world can be crumbling, and it is. And you can stand in faith and say, my God will put me over. My God will give me wisdom. My God will give me access to His power and His presence. I refuse to be defeated. Greater is He that's in me than he that's in the world. I'm not going to lay down to something and start making excuses why I'm not where I want to be. I'm going to start making effort like the woman with the issue of blood. I'm going to start making effort to get to the anointing of God, get to Jesus himself, get to the living word. You know, in Re Revelations, I've told you all, in 19 and 13, it says his name is the word of God. That means Jesus became the word. This is Jesus manifest. He went and this takes the place of Jesus. You know, when people tell me, I want more of Jesus, well, why in the world don't they get more of this? He said, he said, he is the living word. Y'all want me to read it to you? It says this. In the beginning, before all time, was the word, Christ. And the word was with God, and the word was God himself. He was present originally with God. All things were made and came into existence through him. And without him, talking about Jesus, was not even one thing made that has come into being. In him was life. Everybody say, I've got life. And that life was the light of men. Well, we're the light of the world. We, we inhouse the light of God, the presence of God. We become alive to Him through Him. And, and it says, and, and it's the light of men. And the light shines on in the darkness. This is the issue. People start, and I do it too. I have to straighten myself out and, and, uh, and make sure I walk by faith and not by uh, sight. And don't get moved by what people do. Get moved by what the Word of God says and what God does. So if we're the light, if we're the salt, if we carry in the presence of Almighty God, then to learn how to make it operate, we need to get in the book. Jesus is seated at the right hand of the Father. Is that true? Does everybody believe that? Okay, he said, I must go away. I must send the Holy Spirit to bring this book alive to you as you study it because man's wisdom won't get the job done. When you sit down with this book, say, Lord, I'm going to sit down with you today. I'm going to sit down with you, Jesus. 
And it, you see, the written word takes the place of the unseen Christ. The Holy Spirit was sent to interpret and bring that and to teach you through the Word of God, through the fivefold ministry gift, to encourage you to walk in the wisdom of God, revelation of God, the knowledge of God, to understand that you're not here just to be blessed, but you're here to be developed, to co fulfill the great commission that the world be drawn to Christ through the gospel that comes through your lips and your life. So as we begin to understand that this word, when people say, I just need more Jesus, well, that, you know what they just told me? No Bible in their home. No Bible at the morning prayer. No Bible at the morning devotional. No, Bi no Bible at the evening dinner table. No Bible during the day when they can. Let me tell you, you want more Jesus, you get more of this. Because this is what takes the place of, of the unseen Christ. Dean, I heard you come over a while ago. Thank you for letting me know you was here. Did y'all hear that earlier? He let us know he, he flew right over the building. It was loud. Dean, I want to thank you for your faithfulness. I want to thank you that you'd fly all the way back in from your big fly-in down in Casa Grande that you thought it was greater and more important to be in this service than to stay with all the friends down there. This is just called commitment to the body of Christ. Amen? That wasn't to make anybody feel good. It was to give you something to shoot at. <laughs> The Word of God is alive. The Word of God imparts faith to you. If you want to walk where God walks, if you want to do the works that Jesus did and greater than these, he, Jesus said, these things you're seeing me do, uh, the woman with the issue of blood, Jairus' daughter, whenever uh, uh, the servants came up to Jesus and, and said, Jairus, your daughter's dead. Leave the master alone. There's no need to come to the house. She's already died. The Amplified says this. Jesus said he overheard heard them but he ignored what they said some of you start might need to start ignoring some voices you're hearing he ignored what they said and they kept walking toward the dead girl knowing that when life was imparted she would respond and she did respond and when he got over to the house they hackled cackled laughed at Jesus, made fun of him, said, what do you think you're doing? The girl's already dead. He just looked up. He said, get them out of here. We don't need that unbelief in this house. And he walked in. And he saw the 12-year-old girl laying there. And it was as simple as the word of the living God coming forth. And his words were, Awake out of your death sleep. Immediately the girl responded, woke up, got up, and was hungry. Then the laughers, the ones that made fun, then the ones that called you radical, then the ones that called you ignorant, that you would believe God above your circumstances, that when it looked like you wasn't going to make it through life, when it looked like they had repoed everything you ever owned, when it, and you begin to say, my God puts me over. When I put my hands to something, they prosper. I'm not backing off of this thing. For me to fail, God would have to fail because I'm a man of faith and the Word cannot fail and the Word's in my heart and it's coming out of me. I'm not backing up. This nation ain't going to succumb to no uh, liberal fascist communist we're going to rise again in jesus name and we're going to do it through faith in god faith in the word of god faith it takes to stand up and be mighty and don't think it isn't your job or responsibility when god established this church and when he established this nation he had did it with a purpose in mind and it was to impact other people's lives throughout the whole world not just in your own four no more type setting get out of that mindset say it oh. get 
get the passion of God in your life and know you've been born for now. Know that every voice is telling you that you're a nobody, been put down. You have no power. There's too many big powers out there fighting the real conservative man and woman of God. Let me tell you, there's one power that's behind you, and it's the greatest power that's ever been, and His name is God Jehovah, Jesus Christ of Nazareth. The true and living God will not let you down. He will back up that word when He reminded His people, greater is He that is in Steve Ralph, Clark Compton, Do we believe that? Do we believe it to stand up in the face of a giant that's screaming and laughing and hollering like he did David, a young man? Do we believe it enough? Do we have enough passion for God? Do we want to stand up strong? Or do we want to sit with the armies of God that's been divided for 40 days with a giant? Oh, we'll just stay around our campfire. That's too radical. He's too big. We're not going to do anything about this. We're going to sit around. And if anybody comes to change the situation, we're going to scold them and send them out of here. His own brothers said, you young, get back up. Where are those few sheep? They didn't just say sheep. They said, where are those few sheep that daddy put you in charge of? Demeaning him, bringing him down, making him wanting to doubt in the God that sent him there. And he said, let me tell you, is there not a cause? Think a minute. Think a minute. Is there not a cause for a group of God's people to get fed up enough that they get in the Word of God, they begin to eat it on a daily basis with the expectancy that the Holy Spirit's going to bring it alive and your gift inside of you is going to put you in front of great men that's going to change their heart because Almighty God needs men and women just like you. If, 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 if all these mega churches with 40,000, 68,000, I, I, I mean, if they were doing the job, why ain't they doing the job? If it does a job, then why ain't it being done? Because of a socialized, seeker-friendly gospel to build crowds and congregations, not people. I will stand before God and I will say, the message I preach is the message that Paul preached. And if anybody preaches any other message than the one Paul preached, let them be accursed. Well, that's what he said. Why did he say it? Because the problem with the Word, nobody gets in the Word hardly, and so it opens up opportunity for churches all across this land. Every denomination, every one of them has a problem with inward struggle. Is that not true? So what I'm saying, get in this book. Get to the Word. Let faith... Faith comes by hearing and hearing the Word of God. How many times do I have to say that? <laughs> Thank you, Miss Cindy. <laughs> what I'm saying is this. It is a time to check our priorities. It is a time... Let me tell you, nobody thought in 2006 that our economy would be where it is today. Nobody thought when they was paying $400 a square foot for a house in Scottsdale they won't bring 50. No, no, everybody thought they was on a ride and no matter what they did with their life, no matter how they saw God, no matter what they allowed in our government, no matter what was allowed in this nation, no matter what we allowed as a church, we would be okay. Well, it proves we won't be okay. It proves that through faith of the word of the living God with passion in the heart of a man or woman of God that we are willing to give it all just like our forefathers was with. We're too attached to our things.
We need to be willing to sow just like Jefferson and Washington and all these guys that got a hold of the Word of God and the 26 or 29 ordained ministers that signed the Declaration of Independence. They gave their life, their families, their home and everything so that we could have a nation that would come above and beyond and be governed by Almighty God, not by a bunch of atheist, communistic pigs. Oh, What I'm saying, I, I, we got to get, we can't just have church like we used to have. We can't just, it's all about me and my four no more, and the least little word comes up, offends you, and you run off, and you do this. I don't care. Because you know what? If we don't have a change of heart, we're going down the tube just like unbelievers and we won't accomplish a thing because we've got to stand the test of time and that takes loyalty. That takes a decision inside of you that God has placed you in a place to make a difference and no hell, no devil, no circumstance, nothing will get you off track because you've got a vision with God and you've got people of like faith to stand up and be counted and I'm telling you that's where we're at right now it's going to take the word of God like we've never seen it to stand up you think I'm discouraged I'm encouraged I don't want to be like uh, a lot of seeker friendly I want to be just like Jesus if you're in here and you don't believe that the girl's going to be raised from the dead get them outside put them out you say, man, I ain't ever heard a pastor talk like that. Well, you ain't ever been in a season like this. <laughs> he knew those that would hang around the peripheral. He knew those were sitting guff with nothing but their own pride. He knew that would stop the flow of the living God. He knew he needed to get that influence out of that girl's room because that girl's life was at stake. Our church, our nation is at stake. My God, don't you know it? We can't keep going like we are. We have got to turn back to this book, which is the inspired word of the living God, and expect the Holy Spirit to give us some wisdom and understanding. And you may say, well, I'm just a plumber. I'm just a carpenter. I'm just this. I'm just a little kid from Godly, Texas that raised beef cattle all growing up and milked cows on the farm and fed steers, solids. But who cares? Paul said, it's not Paul. It's not Apollos. It's a living God flowing through men and women like you and me that's the issue oh. we need this word of faith to be imparted inside of us to give us a strength that we will not yield to foreign forces in this nation do you understand what I'm saying and it's going to take men and women like you God's not looking at your credentials. God's not looking at your decrees. God's not looking at uh, other experiences. He's looking for a heart that will yield to Him, that He can bring alive and then put His Word in you and bring wisdom out that can save a church and a nation. He's looking for you to be empowered by Him. And this is the empowerment tool he gave. The Word of God builds love. You talk about uh, love. Love. I've had more of those milk toast loving Christians stab me in the back than anybody I ever had. You say, well, what are you talking about? Let me tell you what I'm talking about. It talks about in the first John, the fourth chapter, Beloved, y'all heard, have y'all sang, Beloved, love one another. <laughs> anyway, Beloved, let us love one another, for love springs from God, and he who loves his fellow men is begotten, born of God, and is becoming progressively to know and understand God. How do we know and understand God? Through this book, not through an imagination. It's not through a feeling. It's through the Spirit. It says, 
How do you know a man or woman is, is a child of God? They are led by the Spirit of God. Amen? So, so what have we got here? Beloved, let us love one another. Let us recognize and get a better and clearer knowledge of God. How do we do that? Through the book. Now, if your emotions have been running crazy on you and you've been thinking thoughts you shouldn't, get in the book. It will deliver you. It says powerful, even deciding uh, it, it will divide the joints tomorrow. It will actually divide a human thought from a godly thought. It will divide a human emotion with a godly leading. It will show you what is right and what is true as we do this, okay? It says this. As we begin to love, if you want to have the true love, I'll tell you what love really is. It's God's action through a believer. He said, I am love. God said, I'm, I am love. He said, perfected love casteth out all fear. How do you perfect love? First of all, you get in this book and you learn what it says. Okay? And so then we go on down. It says, he who does not love has not become acquainted with God, as does not or never did know him, for God is love. For this is the love of God. It was made manifest, it played where we are concerned, in that God sent His Son. This is love. Have you been sent? It ain't whether you welcome somebody at the door, although we like to do that. It's not whether we get a kiss on the cheek every time we see you, although that's scripturally correct. Let me show you what true love is. It says this, in this, the love of God was made manifest, displayed where we are concerned, in that God sent His Son, the only begotten, the unique Son, into the world so that we might have life through Him. Agape love is not an emotional thing. It's not a feeling. It is a direction from Almighty God that causes you to act out the will of God. What was Jesus doing here? True love is Jesus was put in a position that he even prayed, Father, is there any way to take this cup from me in the Garden of Gethsemane? And he said, nevertheless, not my will, but that true love will cause you to sacrifice, cause you to go the extra mile, cause you to stand up strong uh, whenever you really don't want to in your flesh. I'm telling you, the love of God will defend the Word of God. It says it, but that he loved us. It says that he sent his only son, the unique son, into the world that we might have life through him. And this is love. Not that we loved God, but that he loved us and sent his son as a perpetuation, the atoning sacrifice for our sins. Beloved, if God loved us so very much, so we ought also to love one another. Does that mean in Ephesians 5? that we need to lay our life down for one another. Talks about husbands and wives. It said that, that husbands ought to give their life, ought to give it up, like Jesus did for the church. That we need to wash one another with the word of the living God. It says the washing of the word of God cleanses us and sets us on top. It will let us see what true love is. True, true love doesn't mean that you don't ever raise up a standard against the enemy. True love means that you're the first one to do it. What happened to Goliath's head after... See, David, every time faith comes, a negative, unbelieving voice comes. Every time. Jairus said, Jesus, my daughter said, come help me. Immediately when Jesus started walking toward the house, the servants came. And... They were walking, and the servant said, Forget it, she's dead. He said, If you come, my daughter will live. The servant said, Forget it, she's already dead. I'm talking about immediately. The man standing on the side of the road that was blind. Get a hold of this. Jesus is walking with his big entourage around him. Everybody wanted to see what was going on. They wanted to see the commotion. It reminds me of the church today. Get the anointing flowing. They want to stand on the perimeter. But what we need is somebody that will raise a voice of faith. There was a blind man standing there. And he said, Oh thou son of David. He recognized his authority. You understand me? And do you know what the people around... Oh, 
calm down, quieten down. Don't be so loud. And you know what he did? He knew who was coming down the road. He couldn't see him with his natural eye, but he sensed him in his spirit. And by faith rising inside of him, everybody said, you're causing a commotion. Let him alone. You know what he did? He went from about 30, O thou son of David, I need healing. Be quiet. Don't you know that's not proper? That's not clinically correct. You can't, you can't do that in church. You can't have the gifts of the Spirit working in the church. So, settle down. You're going to embarrass somebody. You're going to run somebody off. You know what he did? He went from 30 decibels up to about now. Oh, thou son of David! And when he raised his voice, the Son of the living God, God Himself manifested in the flesh. A man walking right there on the earth heard Him and He responded. And He said, what do you need, blind man? Why does He always ask a blind man? Why, why did He ask the man that was laying at the pool of Bethesda, what do you need? He knew what He needed. He wanted to hear it out of His mouth. I want to see and I'm trusting in you. I want to... Walk, I'm trusting in you. I want this blood issue to quit. I'm trusting in you. That was what was being expressed through their life. And, and he kept hollering, and faith was relieved. What about the people that cut the, the very roof out of a guy's house? Can you imagine cutting, uh, taking the, the, the tiles off of a guy's house? They probably didn't even know because Jesus was in there. And it was for their friend. And he went up on the roof to lower him down, and he said, Man, I saw their faith. Love requires a faith action. Love requires to get your neighbor when they don't even believe healed. Love is uh, going forth and making a difference in the city and the nation when you don't feel like. Love is coming and praying when you don't want to, but yet God's inspiring you to. Love will cause you to do things your natural man don't want to do. We knew God, we knew Jesus' natural man didn't want to go to the cross because he voiced it. But he took precedence over that by the Spirit of the living God. And he was strengthened. And Jesus sent an angel to minister to him. And he got strengthened. And he said, I'm, in, I'm going through with this. I'm doing the will of my Father. There ain't no demon, no thought, no nothing. He began to sweat great drops of blood when he saw what he was going to have to do. And all of a sudden he said, send me on, Lord. Send me, Father. I'm going to fulfill this because he saw Randall. He saw Eric. He saw Cindy and Clark. And he saw Kelly. He saw all these folks sitting here over 2,000 years down the road, and he said, I'll do it. Because without it, they won't be there. But with it, we've got a chance for the biggest harvest that has ever been brought about. Billions of souls reunited with God Almighty. And that's because the living Word became flesh and walked among us. The same living word will generate the same faith in you if you'll get in it and let it become alive. I'm not even through my love part. We're going to go next week on meditate on the word of God. The word of God is health to your flesh. The word uh, shall not pass away. It will always be with you. The word of God used for warfare, spiritual warfare. Also... Uh, the Word of God brings deliverance and healing to anyone that will do it and also to encourage you to be a doer and not a hearer only. And we need to make some quality decisions. We need to see the Word by meditating in it. We need to say the Word by declaring it. And we need to act on the Word by doing it and being the men and women God has called us to do and be in this season. Don't let someone that's not had the same privilege you have by hearing the word on a constant basis, talk you out of finishing your faith race. God's people, I believe, will always be his remnant that makes a difference. Now, a lot of other people's going to benefit. 
But if you want to be in the majority, you're in the wrong place here. But if you want to be the victor that brings God the glory because he's the one that wins our battles, then you're in the right place. You're in the right place then. If you're willing to lay away and lay down your own desires and pick up God's will and His desire so that He comes to maybe insecure men or women, maybe women and men that don't understand fully, and He manifests Himself to bring a victory like you've never seen that He's going to get the glory like He did through Cyrus, then you're in the right place. If you want to stand before the Lord and coming into the toughest season that we've ever been in as a nation and a church, nationwide, then you're going to have to be inspired to get in the Word and walk by faith, not by sight. And you're going to have to stand up in the face of the enemy and say, no, I don't allow that. I allow this. Let me help you here. It's going to be the Word of God or it ain't going to be nothing. You, you understand what I'm saying? I look at Tanner and your family here and I think about their future. And we can't run our business like we used to if we want them to have a great future. We got to run our business the way he says to run it and be willing to not be politically correct but be godly right and do what he says and when we do yeah God prophesied through me several months ago that we was going to go through a tight spot I remember prophesying I, I remember the Lord saying get you people ready but you know when you come out the other side you're cleaned up and all the bumps and all the things are scraped off because you're going through a tight spot. And uh, then you begin to operate as a smooth working body of Christ, loving one another through your actions, through your commitment, and through your diligence that our thoughts are just not on us, on our anointing, on what we get, what we do. It's on what we can supply what we can give, how we can help someone, how we can pray for someone and know if we get our hands on them, they're going to recover. Because Jesus said so. You see, God wanted to, some of y'all think we're in a tough spot. Now we ain't no tough spot. I was in a tough spot in the biggest healing revival when my 15-year-old son died. That's a tough spot. And the tougher spot is to look at the Word and say, I go with you. I don't go with circumstance. It's a tough spot when you have to make decisions that's going to seemingly cost you. But the thing about it is, you've got to keep going with God and don't make excuses why something went wrong. God is a deliverer, a savior, a motivator. Jesus is the biggest motivator I ever met. He is one that will bring you in beyond. You've got to get thinking like God. We cannot be killed in the Spirit. When these bodies die, they go to be at the Lord if they know the Lord. While I, I know a couple that come to my mind right now. We prayed. And we believed God for their daughter, and she died. They allowed a human death to affect spiritual life from now on. They quit the church, signed off, and signed out. Not understanding that the love of God causes us to come back to a place and say, Father, thank you, I didn't want them to go. But I want to thank you. I've got all confidence that your word is inspired and God breathed. 
And you said the man or woman that knows you, the minute they come out of these old bodies, they're going to be with you and they're going to get a new body someday. Why can't we look at it like that? God made a provision. He knew we was in the war. He knew spiritual war was going on. He knew the fall had taken place. He knew the second Adam come to restore us. We preach 100% of that. I know we're not going to be at 100%. <clears throat> but I know this. We can walk by faith and not by sight, Eric. We can look at the mercy and the goodness of God that he made a provision for every step of our life. Every step that we take should be governed by the Spirit of the living God. And we should be encouraged to understand don't be so mortal that you forget about immortality. I'm, I'm on your side. God sent me here just for you today. God told me to come and inspire great men and women of God to stand up and forget your losses, your failures. Forget the mistakes that you wished you'd have never made and let God inspire you to a new place. Don't allow those things to drag you down and pull you back. Be inspired by faith this morning. Get in your word. Begin to make declarations when it looks impossible. Michael Swartz, a young man in West Palm Beach, Florida. I've told the story, but I want to encourage you with this. Twelve years on heroin. We had a van that we went out and picked up people in the gutters of West Palm Beach three or four nights a week. And then we brought them in to detox them. Michael Swartz was laying literally on his face in a gutter. I mean, it was in the gutter on the side of the road. We stopped in our van. <laughs> we hop out and grab him. He's a heroin addict. We get him in our van. And uh, Glenda Rambo was one of our people then. <laughs> we were radical, man. You talk about radical. We beat the devil up bad. We begin to lay hands on him, slap him, get him around command that demon to leave him, to command sanity to come to his mind, release the Holy Ghost upon him, got him set free, brought him back, housed him, and I put one of Charles Cowp's books, God's Creative Power Work for You, that little white book. All of our people that got delivered had to have that book all the time because it's nothing but Scripture and declaration. Two years down the road, he had never missed, I made him go to, we had a Bible school in three nights a week. If they work with us, three nights a week they're in Bible school. One night a week they're in church, and every Sunday they're in church. No exceptions. If you didn't want to do it, go back and lay on your face in the gutter. Because you've got to know the truth, because the truth will make you free. A couple of years later, he never missed a service, never missed a school. He was so hungry for God. He's passing out invitations to about 500 people at the church. I said, what are you doing, Michael? He said, I'm passing out an invitation to my wedding. I said, oh, praise God. Who is she? She said, well, she hadn't come yet. But I've been declaring it, and I'm calling her in, according to Romans 4, 16 and 17. I serve a God that raises the dead and calls the non-existent thing as though it already existed. And I'm calling her in, and you know what? I'm telling you the word works. And, and a little while, and he's a skinny little guy, and he's come out, and, and 12 years on heroin, it kind of beat his body up a little bit. But let me tell you something. God healed his body. He set him back. He made him strong as everything again. And he had a beautiful woman walk in with him one Sunday. And she is on fire for God. So this is my new wife. It wasn't, but a, it wasn't very long after that. And you know what? They got married and had two daughters. And he went into business, in the landscape business. And she worked with him. And he began to preach the gospel. Last time I heard of him, 20 years he'd been preaching the gospel. Don't tell me the word don't work. Don't tell me that radical Christianity isn't good. Don't tell me that we can't make a difference.
Because you know what? We've already made a difference. And we're making a difference today. You make a difference by sitting in these seats to inspire those next to you not to lose hope but have faith in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, I love all of you. I speak. I come against oppression. I'll not allow it to operate in any of our people in Jesus' name. I curse it and cause it to leave. I release the anointing of the Spirit of the living God to bring life and protection. In Jesus' name I pray. I bind up the spirit of fear that's over people not knowing what they're going to do. I bind that in Jesus' name. I release the wisdom of God. I call for God to tap you on the shoulder to give you encouragement through the Word of God and through the Holy Spirit of the living God to encourage you that the game's not over. We've just got in. We're in the last inning. I never will forget when Texas played Michigan in the Rose Bowl. They had never been in the Rose Bowl. And Michigan had been there, I think, 16 times. And 35 seconds left on the clock. We're living in that little log house. And they're behind two points. And I tell Patricia, I said, they've blown the, the game. They, they, 35 seconds, they could have won the game, they'd blown the game. She said, you know, honey, the game ain't over yet. And I'm here to tell you, in 35 seconds, a team that had never been to the Rose Bowl, a team that had never been on, up in that place before, came back, and I believe because I'm from Texas it was a miracle, but came back and miraculously kicked a field goal and won by one point in the last couple of seconds. We're in the last couple of seconds. And just because you've never been here before, and just because the opponent is the greatest liar and deceiver, don't mean you can't win. Because there's going to be a fresh wind of the Holy Spirit blow up on your life. Hallelujah. Different than ever before. Don't look back. Always look up. They're from beneath. You're from above. He's on your side, Randall. Amen. Father God, I praise you. Let's have communion. I worship you and I honor you and I thank you for this opportunity to encourage your people to take a stand and not to be afraid but to walk by faith. Father, give us wisdom to make a difference in our nation. Give us wisdom to know how to run our families and encourage them. Give us revelation knowledge, Lord, for this season like never before. And I pray for opportunities for daddies and mothers here that need a breakthrough financially. And Father, I give you praise for it because I know you'll do it. I know you'll open the door up. We give you praise in Jesus' name. And we thank you, Jesus, for what you did on Calvary's cross that we might have life. In Jesus' name, amen. I believe the Holy Spirit is telling me something. I know you've been buffeted and beat. Things come up and down. Things you didn't really want to happen. But let me tell you something. God's speaking to me that you're going to be a voice in the last move. Don't give up or cast away your confidence. All the failures you've had ain't going to do nothing but be stepping stones to your success that God's given you because it's for His sake that He saved you. It's for His sake He put you together. And it's His will that's got to be carried out like never before. 
in Jesus' name. We've already prayed, thank the Lord for what he's done. Remember now, when we get through here, we're going to have a meal together, and it's important that we have meals together. And sit down together, fellowship. Father, as I look at this, and my heart is torn, thinking about amazing grace, how sweet the sound that would save a wretch like me. Father, we give you the praise and we give you the honor. Forgive us, Lord. Now set us free and encourage every member of this body to be strong. And to seek your will like never before. In Jesus' name, amen. Take the bread and the wine. I don't think I have to do what Caleb did. Whenever they got through everything, got to the other side, he asked for another battle. <laughs> I think we're already in the midst of one. <laughs> yes, Cindy, have you got a? Have you got something here? Um, first of all, we have wonderful nine pots of chili, so make sure to join us after this. Let me see this. You're not going to see it.